Hi everyone, thanks for joining us in our talk, Reverse Engineering Archaeology, about the research process behind Ripple 20. Uh, this is our second take because unfortunately we uh, were able to do the whole first run without recording, so uh, hello again from Arts. A uh, little bit about uh, who we are. So we're JSOF, a software security consultancy that does a lot of security research and penetration testing, uh, focusing mostly on IoT. My name is Shlomi Oberman, I'm a co-founder of JSOF. And we'll be speaking with me today, Moshe Kohl, a security researcher at JSOF, who is also the finder of the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities, and Ariel Sean, a security researcher at JSOF, who was involved in the exploitation and reverse engineering process of Ripple 20. What we'll be talking about today is uh, a little bit of background about Ripple 20 uh, for those of you who haven't heard about it, um, and some pointers uh, on where to find more information. And then we'll go uh, in depth into the reverse engineering process of Ripple 20 and talk about some of the different binaries that we had to reverse engineer uh, in order to piece together a, a, a complex puzzle. Uh, we'll then uh, do a wrap up with some of the conclusions um, that can be drawn uh, from what we've seen about uh, what vulnerabilities look like, vulnerabilities look like in the supply chain um, and what reuse of code looks like in the supply chain. So, Ripple 20. Ripple 20 is a series of 19 zero-day vulnerabilities in a TCPIP communication stack called Trek TCPIP. Um, these resulted in 24 unique patches, and two of the vulnerabilities were reported anonymously, while the rest were reported by JSOF. Um, so it kind of depends how you count, but they were bundled into 19 unique CVEs. And what is interesting about this series of vulnerabilities is that they were amplified by the supply chain. So despite the fact that they were all found in this one piece of software called Trek TCPIP, um, this software uh, is, was uh, written and is still written by an American company called Trek. Um, the fact that Trek had uh, so many clients and sold uh, the software for so many years and the fact that their clients had more clients and more clients uh, led to the fact that the vulnerabilities were amplified by the supply chain, reaching hundreds of millions of devices in a whole range of verticals. Uh, in total, there are probably billions of devices uh, containing the Trek TCPIP uh, stack, but uh, our estimation is that hundreds of millions of devices are actually uh, vulnerable with active code and uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, these are the 19 CVEs of uh, Ripple 20. Out of these, four are critical remote code execution vulnerabilities, whether the other ones have um, ranging effects, such as uh, information leak, the denial of service, or other effects. Uh, for some devices, of course, the of service can be quite bad. For other devices, uh, maybe not so much of an issue. Um, so ranging effect and um, ranging effects per device. Um, the devices affected are devices made uh, by companies you all know, small companies, large companies. Uh, this is a, a, a list, uh, this is a, a sort of a sample of some of the better known um, at least uh, Western companies. There's a whole uh, Japanese uh, branch uh, of the Trek stack that um, is found in a whole bunch of Asian companies. Um, and there's of course uh, many, many uh, more companies. Uh, in total, we reached out to over 100 companies. 30-something um, companies confirmed uh, that they are indeed, uh, their devices are indeed vulnerable to um, the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. Um, while a lot of companies didn't reply at all, and many companies also said uh, that they're not vulnerable. Um, so somewhere between uh, 33 um, confirmed vendors and um, a few dozen uh, still pending vendors that haven't replied yet. The research itself uh, took something like nine months uh, with varying intensities uh, and was conducted uh, from the end of 2019 into the beginning uh, of uh, 2020 uh, with the public disclosure in uh, June of 2020. Uh, in total, we reverse engineered seven different devices before the publication date, before the disclosure. We've um, reverse engineered additional devices since. Uh, some of the devices we reverse engineered in multiple versions. Uh, we'll be discussing five of these devices today uh, just due to time limitations and some of the devices being less interesting. Uh, you'll see we encountered some pretty strange architectures, firmwares, and operating systems. Um, the results of this research um, are quite heavily documented in uh, two white papers, as well as our Black Hat and DEF CON talk, and on our website. 
So anyone looking for more technical details or details about the impact, uh, feel free to go to those resources. Or of course, feel free to reach out. Reach out. So the challenge um, that we faced when we started looking into, um, into Ripple 20, except for the fact that we at first didn't even know where to look, which devices use track, etc., cetera, uh, how to find devices, is the fact that despite being one piece of code, uh, there are many versions. Uh, so different uh, vendors will compile the code differently, they'll use different part of the parts of the code, and the code changes over the years. Um, we knew at the start that there'd be uh, several differences between uh, vendors, but little did we know at the start how complex and how different the, um, the devices would look like. Um, we also needed uh, as much information as possible, ideally debug symbols, uh, the ability to uh, actually perform debugging, the ability to uh, get firmwares, um, etc. And we needed to get uh, multiple data points from different years and different vendors uh, in order to piece together the whole uh, history. Um, as, we, as we started working uh, on Trek, we assembled the, the binaries. Um, we assembled the different uh, devices. We found most of them on the internet. Some of them we had to uh, purchase and they came uh, with a binary, uh, as you'll see. Um, and as we started, um, as we did the reverse engineering and we figured that we're looking at things from different years, uh, different vendors, different branches, different compilations, we started calling this an archaeology project because we were digging into the binary in order to understand uh, what happened uh, historically. Of course, uh, this is not actual archaeology, so we're talking about pre-2000 years. This is our, our prehistory for um, the Trek TCP IP stack and uh, prehistory for many of the devices we use. But um, we found some pretty old code. I think the, the oldest code that we saw in a running device uh, was from 2007, um, give or take. I'll now um, transfer the mic over to Moshe Kohl, who will be talking about um, some of the binaries we looked at. I'm Moshe Kohl, I'm security researcher at JSOF, and I'll begin with how we started uh, the research, and uh, I'll talk about some of the binaries. So, we started the, the research by uh, browsing to, to track websites where we wanted uh, to to learn uh, some more information uh, about the, the track TCP IP stack. Uh, so we were looking for data sheets, manual demos, uh, anything that uh, can help us uh, uh, uncover the, the, the mystery around this uh, TCP IP stack. So uh, we found that track offers uh, several demos. One of the, these demos was a free, free scale a 5208 uh, demo. And uh, from this demo, we were able to extract uh, some useful header files with the uh, function names, structure definitions, uh, some comments, and uh, also the binary itself contained uh, s some uh, function names uh, and some debug symbols. So uh, to some extent, we were able to, to, to learn some information from uh, this demo file. The, the main disadvantage of uh, this demo file is that uh, we, we didn't have uh, debug capabilities so uh, we were looking uh, more closely into the uh, track demo for Windows so this is our first binary so track used to offer a Windows 32-bit demo app I say used to because now the, they <laughs> dropped this uh, demo from the, the website but uh, you can still get it if uh, you want you can see um, in this demo, uh, Trek offers uh, some useful features, some inter interesting uh, features that we, we wanted to look at, such as IPv4, IPv6, uh, DTP client, TCP, UDP, ICMP, etc. So this was uh, good from, from uh, our perspective because uh, we can reverse engineer this binary. This is just a Win32 binary and we can uh, debug it. So uh, the the first step uh, to reverse engineer is to locate the interesting code uh, within the binary itself and uh, we found that this binary had no debug symbol so we, we didn't have any function names or any global variable names uh, etc. Uh, 
Uh, and we were able to, to recover some function names using uh, debug strings. Um, in some function, uh, uh, track logged the, the ent entry of the function and the, the, the return from the function using uh, some log message or so wrote a script that will change the function names. But this applies mostly to IPv6 code and not uh, to IPv4 code base. So we still uh, had to find this uh, IPv4 uh, code base. So the technique we use to, in order to locate the IPv4 code base is to search for the ether type constants in the binary. So record that uh, in the Ethernet packet format, you have the destination MAC address, the source MAC address, and also this, uh, this uh, two byte field called ether type, uh, which specifies the, the upper uh, layer protocol uh, that is how to in interpret the, the payload of the Ethernet frame. So uh, the, the, the constants of the Ether type are pretty unique. So, so we, we just search for the, the, the Ether type constant for uh, IPv4, ARP, and IPv6. We, we search for all uh, of the functions which contain uh, these three constants. And we were, uh, in using this technique, we were able to, to locate uh, TF ether receive, which is the function that is responsible uh, of handling incoming Ethernet frames. So uh, from that point, uh, we were able to, to locate the IPv4 code base, the ARP uh, uh, function that processes uh, incoming uh, packets, and also IPv6. And we started reverse engineering the, the binary. And we found uh, some vulnerabilities in uh, this stage. For example, some of the vulnerabilities, uh, one of the vulnerabilities we found was uh, 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 tracked by CVE 2020-11896, which involved uh, 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 an issue with how the track stack uh, handles uh, fragments over an IP and IP tunnel. And uh, we wanted uh, to test if other devices uh, are affected by this serious uh, vulnerability. So at this point we, we search online for devices uh, which run track and uh, we found this device uh, of a company named uh, Digi and uh, we, we simply found a message on an online forum that uh, says that Digi Connect uses the track TCP IP stack. So we decided to bought this device, this Digi Connect device. You can see it looks like an Ethernet connector, but it's actually full system on module in this uh, little device. And it comes in uh, two flavors. Uh, the first flavor runs embedded Linux and the second runs a proprietary NetPlus OS. And the network stack of the NetPlus OS is uh, track TCP IP, at least in uh, versions uh, greater than uh, 7.0. So we bought the ConnectME development kit and the, the use of the development kit uh, helped us uh, getting started and uh, getting uh, debug capabilities for uh, this device. So we found that the, this uh, new, new Digi device runs on the uh, ARM9 uh, processor. We have debugging capabilities using uh, JTAG uh, interface. And it comes with an Eclipse-based IDE, so we can write software uh, uh, onto this uh, device. So we compiled uh, a simple uh, software, we extracted the, the ELSE file, the resulting ELSE file, and we found that the ELSE file uh, comes with debug symbols. So we have now function names, names of uh, global variables, some structure definitions and uh, offsets. So this really helped us uh, gaining more uh, information uh, regarding the track TCP IP stack. We also developed uh, an exploit for the previously found vulnerabilities, the vulnerability that we found in the, the demo. And the disadvantage of uh, using this device is that uh, we found that uh, it uses relatively old track version. So we wanted to, to find at this point if uh, if the vulnerability affects the, the most recent uh, track version. So we looked for uh, another data points, another binary. 
So this led us to, to Intel AMT. We found the track powers the, the AMT module of uh, Intel AMI. And we speculated that since Intel is a security aware company, they must have updated their track software. So they, they are using the most uh, recent track uh, TCP IP stack with uh, the latest update. So that's what we hoped. And uh, upon looking at the binary, uh, we saw that uh, Intel had some defensive programming, uh, by which I, I mean that they check uh, various length uh, fields uh, in the packet, something we did not see in the previous two, two binaries. And these checks render our uh, uh, previous exploit uh, as, as non, non, uh, the vulnerability was fixed basically in the, these binaries and we, we thought we had one days that still existed in the wild and we were uh, mostly wrong as uh, Trek told us we'll talk about this later so we, we thought that these may be fixes maybe some compile time uh, macro or maybe Intel are uh, just paranoid so uh, during the, the research, Intel uh, published a security advisory and one of the vulnerabilities in this security advisory uh, catches our interest. So you can see the, the description on the slide. It says that insufficient input validation uh, vulnerability exists in subsystem in Intel AMT uh, that may allow an unauthenticated user to potentially enable denial of service or information disclosure via adjacent access. So by adjacent access, uh, we suppose we, they mean um, uh, something that is local to the network link, such as uh, ARP or DTP. So this looks uh, very promising and uh, you see the CVSS score of uh, high and uh, we wanted to patch, uh, to patch the, the MT versions to find the vulnerability because we suspected this vulnerability lies in, in, in the track code basically. So we obtained two EMI uh, firmware versions online, you can find them, and uh, we wanted to, to patch diff between two, these two versions. Uh, we used the EMI analyzer tool to unpack the firmware and extract the MT module, and we used bin diff as our uh, patch diffing tool. And what we found, we found a, a fixed bug uh, in the DCP v6 client uh, of track so during uh, option 24 uh, in DCP v6 which is the domain search list option in the function uh, DCP save reply info which commits the data received from the DCP v6 uh, server so we found uh, a read out of bound vulnerability you can see that in this uh, snippet of code they iterate over length bytes of a label and, and they don't check uh, bounds on the buffer. So this, this snippet very much feels like the, the description of the vulnerability uh, we saw before because it's DTPv6, so adjacent access, and also this uh, out of bound access may uh, cause information leak or denial of service. Uh, for example, if we, we read from uh, an app map uh, page, so uh, we thought we, we found uh, this vulnerability, and we also found that uh, Trek uh, got, got the fix wrong. So you can see in this uh, snippet of code, which is from the uh, more newer version of uh, Intel AMT, you can see that they now check uh, the total length value against some some constant but uh, you still have uh, out of band access so so the the fix uh, was basically uh, not implemented correctly so we reported the, the issue to track and this was uh, this issue was assigned the cv 2020 11.905 so the story behind the uh, intel mt is uh, interesting so some of the vulnerabilities fixed only in intel also intel has uh, export mitigation Diggy, on the other hand, uh, had old code, Intel had new code, Intel had some code, not all of the code. So, uh, until disclosure, we thought that some bugs were uh, one days, 
uh, and Intel was the most updated, but actually Tractor does that these are actually zero day. So the story behind the AMT is uh, unclear. Maybe Intel fixed the, the issues uh, independently. So to summarize, there are a few types of track supply chain vulnerabilities. Uh, ones that are true zero days, uh, ones that are zero days that only fix in Intel and AMT code to our knowledge and not in track upstream. And uh, vulnerabilities that are end days that exist in the wide and fixed upstream but never actually publicly reported as far as we know and we actually don't know if these are considered security fixes. So uh, the, it works like this. If you have a support package uh, of track, then you get updates, feature updates and uh, security updates. And if, if you have no support, then you get no security. Another device that we looked at is the uh, HP printer. So we just googled the uh, common track function names in uh, Google and uh, we found that HP printers uh, uses track uh, as their TCP IP stack and we wanted to check if uh, they are affected by the vulnerabilities. So the, the first step was to obtain the, the firmware and we were able to obtain the, the firmware from HP's public FTP server. So we obtained an RFU file which is a remote up firmware update file which was a highly packed and highly compressed uh, format. It, uh, it requires uh, multi-stage uh, unpacking and uh, the file formats uh, were uh, relatively bizarre. You can see the, the whole process uh, is described in the uh, four-part uh, blog post. Um, and then uh, in uh, HP printers, uh, we found the vulnerability variant. We found that the, the, the previously found vulnerability in the track demo and which was exploited in the Digi CV2020-11896 uh, uh, crashes the printer instead of uh, triggering uh, remote code execution. So you can see in the slip, snippet here that the, the same condition that uh, should actually cause uh, inconsistency and that uh, will lead to remote code execution now uh, causes a TF kernel error function to, to be executed and when TF kernel error executed uh, it causes a kernel panic on uh, HP printers so this causes a, a printer crash so this is a vulnerability variant of, uh, of the, the remote code execution vulnerability so you can see how different configurations and maybe if defs uh, uh, affect the, the research process and the, 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 the research outcomes, basically. So now I'll hand over the mic to, to Ariel Sean. He will talk about a fifth binary uh, of uh, a UPS device from Schneider Electric. Hi, I'm Ariel. I'm also a security researcher at JSOF. And uh, I'm going to talk about the firmware on the Schneider Elec Electric APC UPS device. So UPS is an uninterruptible power supply. And this uh, device by Schneider has a network card running a firmware called APC OS, which uh, features the track TCP IP stack. Uh, so we initially got the firmware directly from the APC website. Um, when we downloaded it as a, an executable, which will update the firmware of the device uh, over the network. And from this executable, we extracted uh, the firmware files. And luckily, they were neither encrypted or compressed, so that was uh, relatively straightforward. And we did have to reverse engineer um, some parts of the firmware image just to understand how to properly load it into our disassembler. Um, but that was relatively easy. And after that, we um, identified some uh, x86 uh, 16-bit opcodes. So we loaded it uh, into Ghidra with the right processor module, but we saw that uh, it only kind of works. Uh, the disassembler didn't manage to resolve uh, far calls in the code, um, and we didn't have many extras. So we understood that maybe our processor module is not a great fit. Um, and the memory addressing in particular looked very strange. Uh, we, we saw x86 opcodes, um, but the segments didn't check out and uh, we figured it can't be protected mode because there were 
a ton of segments and we couldn't find the GDT in any of the firmware files. And it can be a real mode either because a simple shift of the segment part of an address by four bits didn't lead uh, to any code in the example of the far call. So we tried to uh, learn more about x86 and find some, uh, some of the weirder operation modes um, to find something that fits, but we didn't have any luck. Um, luckily, we noticed a pattern, um, noticed initially in uh, uh, strings, that the least significant byte of a string's effective address appears uh, in push instructions in the vicinity of the, str of the string. So we figured this is most likely um, the string is actually pushed as an argument uh, to some string manipulating function. So uh, we figured this is not a coincidence and um, as you can see this pattern is just right for a, shi uh, for a shift by uh, 8 bits instead of 4 bits. So we manually tried to shift some uh, far calls by 8 bits instead of 4 bits and some uh, pushes of strings and we saw everything checks out and far calls actually resolve to a uh, function prolog. So this was the solution. Um, initially we didn't understand exactly why and what does this mean, but it still worked, so we tried to implement it. Um, initially we tried to recompile Ghidra's x86 processor module to support the 8-bit shift, but that didn't really work. Um, we didn't have any string xrefs and also some of the far calls were still broken, so uh, that didn't work out. We also tried to do something similar in the configuration of Radare, um, which resulted in a better firmware image, but still uh, it lacked strings and other XRefs. Um, and finally, we found the solution on OpenRCE, some guy that posted the, this exact, exact problem in 2008, and uh, the great Igor Skoczynski uh, offered a solution that also worked for us, and to simply create a lot of segment selectors in IDA with the 8-bit shift already calculated in. So we did this using an IDA script that uh, iterated over the far calls and generated the right segments. And then we could actually start reverse engineering. So when we reverse engineered, we found on the device a newer version of Trek than the one we found on the Digi device, uh, which I talked about earlier. And in this version, we also found a new vulnerability uh, of the CVE 2020-11901 family of vulnerabilities. And we call this one the bad RDNA vulner vulnerability, uh, which essentially results from a bad fix of a previous uh, vulnerability in the same family. Um, this vulnerability did not exist in uh, Intel AMT simply because uh, they turned off this feature. So the code is not there. It's not used. Now I'll uh, pass the mic back to Shlomi for a wrap up. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Moshe. Uh, before I uh, wrap up and draw some conclusions, let me just mention that, um, of course, most of the vendors that we discussed and most of the devices that we discussed um, do have patches available. So as long as uh, you are running the latest versions of the devices, uh, they are no longer affected and, and the vulnerabilities are fixed. Um, this was reported back in June, so um, there are patches for everything available. Um, so, um, what conclusions can we draw and what takeaways can we take from, um, from what we've learned from reverse engineering all these binaries and um, the vulnerabilities that we saw? Um, one thing we can definitely say is that the supply chain is uh, complicated and complex. Uh, we looked at these different binaries. Every binary taught us something new. Um, if we look at more binaries now, we still learn new things about uh, the track, um, the track stack. So supply chain can get very complex. Second thing is that obscurity mostly doesn't work. So despite the fact that HP uh, firmwares were uh, compressed in multiple levels, despite the fact that this is a proprietary piece of software, um, despite the fact that the supply chain was mostly obscure and completely not public and maybe because of these reasons uh, still we were able to find lots of vulnerabilities that affect all of these devices. Um, a, a key takeaway both for asset owners and for device manufacturers it, is that they should know uh, where their code comes from and uh, they should make sure that the code uh, that comes from third parties uh, is ideally fresh but even if not fresh that all vulnerability uh, fixes and patches are taken from the app 
from the upstream uh, suppliers um, and that they know when there are security features, uh, security uh, fixes. This also means uh, keeping an update uh, package, a support package uh, in place in most cases. Um, and very important, the deeper we go in the supply chain, and Trek was pretty deep in the supply chain, the higher the security impact and the wider the security impact. So this has implications both for uh, target selection for researchers, um, but also for device manufacturers um, and uh, suppliers of code. If your code is going to run in billions of different devices, um, maybe it's more important uh, to review that code for security issues uh, than other code that will only run, run on one or two or three devices. Um, this also teaches us something about um, the lack of, uh, of um, uh, standardized and formalized ways um, for software providers um, to communicate and to uh, give assurance of what happens uh, when there are security issues, what the security of the software looks like, um, how long do they take to report security issues as well. And, and things of this sort. There are some ISO standards um, for device manufacturers, um, but there are no standards across the supply chain, how this is communicated from vendor to vendor um, throughout the supply chain. Um, something interesting that, uh, or an interesting question that this raises is the question of proprietary software versus open source software. Um, we don't think there are any conclusions here, uh, but it does raise a, a question um, personally, I'm not sure that proprietary is necessarily more secure or more insecure than open source software, but there are trade-offs uh, and there are differences. And uh, one of the trade-offs is that proprietary software um, often doesn't have as many eyes on it as open source. Um, one interesting side effect of, uh, of Ripple 20 and of supply chain uh, issues in general is that patch propagate happen at different paces. So if one vendor patches and another vendor doesn't patch, um, then a security researcher or a malicious actor can look at the difference between um, these two vendors, between these two firmwares, and find vulnerabilities for free. Right. So if um, Intel AMT update their firmware and fix it, but a different, a different vendor doesn't uh, apply the fix, um, especially if the fix wasn't public and they don't even, uh, they might not even know about the fix or they missed the fix, um, they might have a vulnerability that um, is much easier to find. There's no research needed that needs to be done. Just look at the difference uh, between the versions, look what was patched in one vendor and you find vulnerabilities in another vendor. Kind of like patch gapping but on steroids because this could be uh, going on for years. So uh, to summarize, um, we went through a complex reverse engineering process, um, multiple different binaries, different architectures, uh, different reverse engineering uh, challenges, um, a lot of forks in the software library. Uh, the different forks revealed more vulnerabilities as we did uh, patch diffing and as we found bad fixes uh, and different vendors using different parts of the code and compiling it differently. Um, supply chain makes security extremely difficult uh, for everybody involved in the supply chain and we need uh, new ways to communicate and new ways uh, to deal with these issues. And um, we learned that the propriety update process uh, is extremely obscure. Uh, nobody exactly no knows exactly how um, this is supposed to work and nobody knows exactly how this does work. Uh, oftentimes um, it works differently for every vendor uh, and for every case. Thank you very much. Uh, for listening to our talk, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, on our email. Uh, follow us on our Twitter um, and our LinkedIn. Um, and um, feel free to look at the in other information uh, released about Ripple Twenty uh, in different mediums. Thank you, Shlomi, Moshe, Ariel. Thank you for that um, really um, interesting uh, talk. Uh, Shlomi, first of all, can you hear us? I can hear you. Hi, everyone. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Fine. So the, the first question is that uh, uh, that's about supply chain security, basically. Is there any correlation between the price and the security level of the product, given that you would know what is the security level of the product? 
So uh, I think that's something that's very ha hard to answer because both the security level and uh, the price are both uh, non-public and hard to, um, to reach. But uh, gut, gut feeling is that there is no correlation. Um, Trek is a relatively high-end uh, stack and um, you know, some TCP stacks are open source and are more secure. Um, so probably very little correlation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I have personally um, uh, one question. Um, you, you basically um, stated that uh, there were a, a fair amount of uh, devices uh, that are, are still uh, vulnerable uh, to the, uh, the different uh, problems that uh, you've, been, you've been finding. Um, my first question is, uh, what, what is currently or what could be the potential impact of those vulnerability? Uh, because they've got a pretty high CVSS uh, score. Uh, and the other question is, uh, what could be the mitigation for uh, the organization that do operate such devices? Right, so the, the different vulnerabilities um, range in their uh, impact and the impact also ranges per device. Uh, in the most severe cases, the vulnerabilities allow uh, complete remote code execution. So a takeover of the device and that will require an attacker to either be uh, in the same network as the device or to somehow be able to intercept uh, DNS traffic because some of the vulnerabilities are uh, DNS client-side vulnerabilities, and that might travel uh, to outside uh, your network. And then depending on the device and the security requirements of that device, uh, as well as how it was compiled, uh, the effects can change. Um, so uh, the effect can definitely be uh, large and the impact can, can be uh, quite serious. Um, we listed a, a set of mitigations. Uh, most of them are quite common sense uh, mitigations, including uh, segmentation of networks, uh, the use of firewalls, and uh, quite interestingly and quite effectively, uh, just removing TCP IP uh, features that are not commonly used and that are not needed by the devices in your network uh, will block most of the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. Um, we also can say that they will block other TCP IP vulnerabilities, both um, those that have been disclosed in the past, as well as uh, you know, others that will be disclosed in the future. Um, and um, if someone has devices that for some reason can't be patched or patches are not available, uh, CERT CC and ICS CERT have listed, uh, as well as us on our website, have listed a, a, a series of mitigations that, uh, that can be put in place. Okay, thank you. I've got I've got a question. Um, you you mentioned um, the difficulty for um, uh, the different um, uh, supplier uh, to deal with this um, inconsistent level of uh, uh, of uh, patching. Uh, what what would be your advice to a company such as Trek uh, to deal with this community of? Uh, 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 of customer to avoid running in such an inconsistency situation? So um, I actually think that the situation with Trek is maybe better than in some cases because um, Trek has a one sort of monolithic product and not many branches as far as we can tell. So at least everybody or almost everybody can get patches, um, but Two main recommendations are using initiatives like uh, SBOM, uh, Software Bill of Materials, um, so that every manufacturer knows what software is inside their product, uh, and it's easier to communicate and to know uh, when patches need to be distributed. Uh, and another um, general recommendation is uh, to review the code and to use um, exploit mitigations. And then the deeper you are in the supply chain, um, review the code more and use more exploit mitigation. And, and TCP IP stacks are a great example of code that should really be reviewed or, or any communication stack 
should really be reviewed again and again and again, um, right? Whether it's TCP IP or a Bluetooth stack uh, or, or any other kind of, of communication stack that is, is basically a huge attack surface um, should be reviewed more uh, than other types of code. And then uh, that will reduce the, the amount of vulnerabilities that have to be patched over the years. Okay, thank you, Shami. Apparently, the, uh, there isn't any, any more uh, question. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, you again, uh, as well as um, uh, Moshi and Ariel, uh, for uh, showing your work and sharing your uh, archaeologist uh, experience uh, in the vulnerability business. We appreciate, and um, uh, we wish you to have a very nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the host and thank you to everyone that, uh, that joined and have a, a great rest of the conference. Bye everyone.